thank you for having us, Canberra Modern. It's just been so fascinating so far. Um, I'd also like to pay my, re my respects to the traditional owners of this land on which we've been born, many of us here, um, and which we continue to live. And I, I want to um, reflect a little bit on those sorts of conversations um, in, this, in this little talk. My childhood world was the suburb of Campbell. In 1963, when I was born, it was new, and so was I. My experience of being born in this Canberra the year before the lake was filled, so I'm, I'm kind of like the lake was trying to be there. It was the big flood of 64, and I'm born 63. It was meant to be there in 63, but didn't come until 64. Um, but then, and so I had a fa fantastic time as a, as a young child and then was educated here. But at 20, I got out. And I guess the, for many in my generation, you just couldn't get out fast enough. And if you were at a party in Sydney and someone would ask, where are you from? And you'd mumble into your hand <laughs> and, um, or else you'd, you'd go through a whole, oh, you know, you poor thing kind of conversation. So I've worked in different parts of Australia and overseas for 30 years, and now coming back to work here has prompted quite a bit of reflection. Um, it actually began when I, I still wasn't back here, but mum, uh, my mum was still here, and I did an exhibition called uh, Growing Up Planned, which is this one here that Roger was in, uh, where I asked people, you know, it was the 100th year, my mum was still in our house, and I wanted to invite some other people like myself who'd been born here and grew up here but hadn't um, uh, hadn't uh, had left either as children or young adults so asked them to make new work as either architects or artists or historians in response to that so I guess I th I then I did a talk in 2018 and I guess in my role now at CMAG I've um, I, I guess you know constantly now working with this material so um, it's that's been an interesting um, journey professionally. So many of us are very familiar with this, um, with the messaging about coming to Canberra in the mid-century and these are just you know a, a small sample of the kinds of images that were produced at that time. Uh, enticing speakers, uh, sorry, enticing families to make their lives here. But I think, um, you know, from what, from certainly just the, the short conversations that we've had so, so far tonight, the richness is actually the individuality of these stories and how we fit in. Um, so for my own family, um, it was as uh, my parents, sorry, um, my parents had met in Canberra in 1956 and married a year later. So they'd actually individually made their choices to be here. My mother had been a boarder at uh, girls' grammar school during the war years and then trained as a kindergarten teacher in Sydney before travelling to London and working there for a couple of years, travelling around the continent as you did. And on her return to Australia, she was anticipating working in Sydney, but an urgent call came from the newly appointed head of the fledgling education department in Canberra to urge her as someone who had gone to school here to come back and teach because there were all these young families moving in um, with little or no family support. So at 23, she was appointed head teacher at the new Reed Preschool with its sparkling modern design set in a pretty square at the heart of the suburb. My father was born in Sydney and came to Canberra in 1951 after graduation from the University of Sydney as a dentist. At the age of 20, because you left school at 16 and nine months, at the, and, and, and so he went straight into dentistry and, and graduated at 20. So it wasn't possible to register formally until you were 21. So he found a commission at RMC Duntroon and worked as a dentist there and moved later to Havelock House, where I, I, you know, many, many relationships would have begun in Havelock House. <laughs> a keen cricketer and tennis player, he joined the Northbourne Cricket Club and went on to play opening bat with a young Bob Hawke for the ACT rep team. So um, that photograph there in the left, I'm, I guess I'm showing you that because I think it's that sense that, um, you know, you didn't know that many people here, so uh, you often joined clubs and societies. And I think Canberra, the, the story of Canberra's clubs and societies, sporting clubs, badminton, you know, whatever it was, um, that was how you met people. Um, the photograph on the other side is, um, uh, is where they lived in the Alloa Flats and in fact my father drove his car from the Alloa Flats to the Bailey Arcade where his practice was which is of course is um... <laughs> so their choice to make their personal lives their their professional lives in Canberra 
came, uh, I guess, from being able to embrace the opportunities for young people that were possibly harder in other parts of Australia. And so from the outset, they were both um, strong advocates for the city and for its potential. Um, and so my father committed to his own financial future in the city by purchasing debentures in the Bailey Arcade in its construction period. Um, and so that was you know, quite a sort of financial commitment. Ooh. Sorry, I'm just no going backwards on my notes. Your notes, not mine. No. <laughs> Here's, the, here's Reed Preschool. Um, and thankfully, this little um, cubby house is still there. Um, it's had some rather unfortunate sort of painting on that. that stri the stripes are gone, but perhaps they could uh, be reinstated. These, I've got a, a lovely roll of these colour slides that were taken on a very you know, bright, sunny day by a parent that were given to my, um, my mother. But this main, this main photograph, I think, really reflects to me one of the concepts of, this, um, of what we're talking about. These, these wooden blocks were actually designed by the Kindergarten Union in Canberra. They were manufactured by um, the woodworking teacher at the Canberra High School. And they were designed to be flexible and to be used in a whole variety of ways for, for educational learning. Here they are, as every child's got their own block and they're in a circle and they're playing a game. So I think that there's there's a lot to, to kind of look at in this kind of um, ground up knowledge about the role of design and the young mind. Um, so, but at the Alloa Flats, they watched the um, Canberra Olympic pool come out of the ground and they loved it. And they saved um, their money. And when they'd saved enough money to build, they tracked down the architect, Ian Slater and commissioned him to make a house for them with a similar aesthetic, long and low, punctuated with modern details. They were also waiting for... Oh, here's another one of the Reed Preschool. They were all also waiting for the suburb of Campbell to be released. They could have purchased an existing home in the already established suburbs with their predominantly, you know, from the 20s to the 40s. However, they were really committed to contemporary architecture. And one of my father's wedding gifts to my mother was a, su a subscription to Harper's Bazaar, but she changed it to American House and Garden, and I've got a couple of the <laughs> copies here. Um, and so for the next five years, she diligently clipped ideas for her future home so that when they were ready to commission the architect and got the money, they, there was a set of ideas ready to go. So on a cold day in 1961, it possibly was this day, my parents waited anxiously for their pick of the last block of land to be sold in a line on that day. And waiting with them was their architect, Ian Slater, who'd just left the relative anonymity of government employment and joined long-established architect Malcolm Moyer in practice to form Moyer and Slater. Looking at this photograph of the block of land that day, you can sort of have a sense of something of the feat of imagination um, that they were bringing to this moment. Um, but actually, um, a few years later, the house looked like this. The garden was established, and this then was our family home for 52 years. And I, so I think, like other speakers um, who have a strong association with the house that they grew up in, it is very much a place that ends up shaping you. Um, so, um, my brother and I, oops. So one of the key ideas that they asked Ian Slater to do was to build an indoor-outdoor room. And here, my twin brother and I came home from the hospital in 1963, and Canberra Hospital, and my mother had a touch-and-go birthing experience. So it was a pretty phenomenal day, actually, that they chose to take this photograph of her at home with both of us. Um, uh, I think my father very relieved um, in that space there. And it became really one of the most successful features of the home um, and a sheltered indoor outdoor living space. And it became um, about seven or eight years later, they did actually put alcinite, a clear alcinite over the roof and turned it into an indoor garden room where it became a place of many parties and coming in from the pool and, and all of this sort of thing. Um, ooh, I'm just, 
um, the interior of the house, um, these are just like a couple of little shots, but I guess these spaces also really shape you. The, the top left there is the, um, as you know, we just finished clearing out to sell it, so there's actually no furniture in it there, but it's, um, you can see it's timber panelled, it's white, it's got the sloping ceilings, the louvered um, doors, and, um, and the view out to the front. Um, but this was that, that sense of that flow between the kitchen and the living room spaces and then it was to the outside. So really very much as the other speakers have spoken about, about it wasn't um, rooms that you closed off, it was, it was a whole flowing space. Um, very common colour tile in the bathroom, that, that sort of greeny, you know, that colour of the bush almost, I think, and that ochre colour, and so I have very vivid memories of that colour green tile. Um, and then uh, Ian Slater designed the second wing of the house, which was always um, intended to be built, um, uh, you know, as the, because, you know, like my brother and I weren't even conceived when they bought, when they, when they first did the first half of the plan. So, um, you know, when we came along, they built the second half, which is what you can see there, and then the pool. Um, and my, my mother here is doing it for an architectural photo photography. It's there in midwinter in Canberra, and she's in the pool. That's why my brother and I are standing on the, on the, on the outside. <laughs> but so why were they so confident in Campbell as a place? And although this is a little bit later, this is 1965, this was very much you know, the idea of this place. So building a planned neighbourhood, permanent parkland, playing fields, tennis, pedestrian parkway, you know, um, the um, very, very much of an emphasis of district recreational area and then planting, you know, you can actually see on, on the border there, you know, planting was going to ring the major um, roads. So that this, this was a really commonly understood way in which a suburb was going to be developed. So. Um, for, for, you know, young parents, they knew that, you know, if they were going to have a family life here, that's, that's how it was going to involve, what, what it was going to revolve around. So um, then as a child growing up, it was, everything was within a, a kilometre of walking distance. The newsagent, the grocery, the butcher, the hairdresser, the pharmacist, the tennis courts for Saturday play, um, and then the school from kindergarten to year six at Campbell Primary, they were all my immediate neighbourhood. But really another, um, I think, really significant thing for me as a child was this sense of, of the fingers of the bush right in um, as, as your direct experience. And so because I walked to school um, and back home every day um, without, you know, just like with other kids or on your own, it didn't matter, but um, you, you were dressed for the extremes of the season and you could dawdle, you could muck around. And so I, I actually took this photograph you know, maybe only just a couple of years ago, but it's still the same. So bits of it are curved and gutted, but the majority of that walk was was not curved and gutted. And so, you know, if there was flooding or if there was dryness, you really, and you know, a child is looking at this height, so you're walking down and looking. So I, I think for me, that's one of the most significant things, that change within nature and a close observation um, within for nature. And then, of course, this... Um, the ability to roam pretty much unchecked. So, um, you know, even a six or seven year old to get, walk all the way up to the top of Mount Pleasant, that was, you know, kind of just what you did. And, and like scrub like this, this is where you'd build, you'd spend the whole day building cubby houses out there. Um, so that was, that was very much that kind of bush experience in, in the new suburbs, which I think perhaps for many um, is still something that you can do. Um, this is a photograph I managed to find of, um, yeah, just as the lake had filled. Mm -hmm. So there's Canberra Hospital, and it's so interesting to sort of see this moment in October 1964. You can you can really see that not much is is there at that point around the lake, and it's so it's kind of easy to forget that it happened really suddenly. And I, I love that Rosalie Gascoigne um, title of that that major work of hers, "Suddenly the Lake," which. I think of as both Lake George and of Lake Burley Griffin, that sense of sudden arrival of the water. And I think, Jeff, your your description of how the lake, you know, I, I really that your um, your understanding of it within as a design element, I think, was really interesting. Um, so yes, Campbell was in that top 
corner there um, below Mount Pleasant. So that was really my hood. But you can just see there also the planning there for Commonwealth Park. So Commonwealth Park was, um, you know, it was a little bit further away, but that crafted water play grove, the circular cast pavers, which some of them are still there, but oh God, if there's one thing that I would bring back straight away, it's the circular carved, car curved pavers, which were just so fantastic. Um, Looking back, you know, now in my role here, I kind of get to look at some of these archival photographs and you realise that, you know, because these are these were done by the Government Information Service and so you, you kind of see your own childhood writ large in these um, formal photographs that were designed for, you know, public consumption, but really realising that this was also very much your own childhood. And again, here's this landscape design about space and freedom in the suburbs. So, um, yeah, these are these are these are very much um, you know designed for um, wider circulation, but they were also very much my own personal experience. Um, um, yeah, and my, my mother had been photographed for the Government Information Service when teaching at, at Reeds. I, I'm not, I won't show you those, but you know, we've got 10 of those. And, and our own house appeared in the NCDC annual report of 1965 as an example of private enterprise building. Mm -hmm. um, in 1967, my brother and I were photographed by David Moore with the newly launched decimal currency for um, a commission spread in National Geographic. So November 1967. Oh, that's me um, and my brother in um, uh, when the mint was when was launching its decimal currency. I wanted to turn to um, I guess looking in a bit more detail at the design for educational spaces um, because education really was promoted to families as um, a, a real kind of message about the kind of future for your family in Canberra was really built on quality educational not only the spaces but the curriculum. So this is the kind of sort of narratives that you'd get in those in those magazines. Um, it, interesting to reflect on the speed with which um, play changed. You know, these these photographs, the colour ones from 1955 of my mother's preschool, show this kind of quite gendered, stereotypical play of the of the girls in the cubby house with the with the um, dolls and the and the prams and so on. But you know, very shortly afterwards. Um, you know, innovation happens quickly, and this, and uh, you know, this is 1972. And I was um, in the first of the um, open plan, well, the first open plan classroom in Canberra, and so being part of that, I guess, experimental learning environment is had a huge impression on me. I remember in grade three, um, an ABC film crew coming in to, to film us. Um, and being, you know, chosen to be the one of the children to, that they were going to focus on, um, and here it was two uh, teachers tag taught two classes of children who were each assigned their own sheet of activities for the week to undertake at their own pace through formal and informal small group or individual learning modules. Um, and this is the plans for that space. So here's Campbell Primary pretty much today. It hasn't changed. Um, doesn't didn't look like it's changed that much. And um, what has changed are the demountables. When I was growing up there, it was a forest of demountables around this. But of course, that's they're they're gone now. But so there was the conversion of this craft, well, general craft space into this open plan learning. Um, and the experiment was led by a senior educational manager and now local, now retired local historian Alan Foskett who was given the opportunity of a six week trip through Europe in 1971 to visit, or 1970, to visit cutting edge educational initiatives and bring some of those findings back to Canberra. His report was immediately and enthusiastically taken up by several primary schools who asked for the same resources and classroom design. And so um, actually in, this, in that one there, you can see the letter, open plan learning for existing primary schools Department has been approached by various older primary schools, blah, blah, blah. The following list is approached. So Aranda, Campbell, Downer, Hackett, Lyons, North Ainsley, North Curtin, Page, Watson and Yarra Lumbler. Um, uh, it's, and it's saying it's not com comprehensive. They all want to do it. Your early advice would be appreciated. So the kind of speed with which um, these sort of new ideas for learning were taken up when, 
you know, I guess most schools still operated on those strict rows and individual seats and tables that, and, you know, that you built up. Um, lift it up. Um, but it sort of went further and I think the teachers were also really encouraged to be innovative themselves and work with the architectural spaces. Um, in my mother's archive I found this really a, a short-lived journal that was published in Canberra called Early Years and individual teachers could talk about different projects that they were doing and this concrete poetry uh, workshop that was done, I've cut up the the school it was in, but um, you know, the, here was a an English teacher, or sorry, a general primary school teacher, um, creating a um, a program of poetry um, in relation to the the architectural spaces that they were working in. Oh, sorry, it's for a vet. For a vet, nineteen seventy five. Um, of course, uh, this having the um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Dame Patty Menzies is said to have been a strong advocate for the needs of children and families in Canberra to her husband, the Prime Minister. We've had some recent conversations about that, haven't we, about um, the role of the, the Prime Minister's wife. Um, and the citizen child, such as myself, also had the opportunity to visit the well-stocked local library and a particular Canberra activity of going to open days at the embassies uh, and consulates, exhibitions at the National Library and, and the Academy of Science. And it was always a thrill to see Farlap's, or slightly gross though, <laughs> um, Farlap's heart at the Academy of Science. Um, uh, and most of these trips would involve usually a take-home brochure that could be cut up for your school projects. So these are the kinds of play structures that we could, you know, be. Um, and you know, thankfully, these, the David Tolley one is still there. I think some of them have, have, are no longer there. And this was my own again. This is, so this is my own experience at, at the Canberra at the Civic Pool. I'm, I'm there in the blue. My brother um, and um, Tookie Wright, who still lives in in Canberra, uh, and her brother and cousins. Um, so you could kind of have this this freewheeling childhood experience. No sunblock. No sunblock. No, no very brown. <laughs> yeah. But I also vividly recall some of the art that I was exposed to, and I suppose this then comes to where I've my, my own professional career has gone in and being primarily a visual art curator, but also in design and architecture. I vividly recall seeing um, this production of the Australian Ballet in 1968 at the Canberra Theatre, but also um, Ava Pachuca's um, this incredible exhibition of um, uh, woven human form forms in the um, uh, life-size figures in the centre of the gallery. Um, that photograph is is actually taken from the... They're now in the collection of the National Gallery, but it, I mean, I would have been about eight or nine. Extremely vivid memories of, of seeing an inst that installation. Um, driving out to see the Nolan the new Nolan at, at Lanyon Gallery with my mother in the mini, all the way to Tuggeranong. My God, that, that was like the end <laughs> of the picnic. Yeah. Yeah. And the little mini made it out there. But um, you know, that was that was really special to see that. Um, and I I just recently took some photographs of some of the posters in the basement of the Canberra Theatre and came across this one of this Polish theatre in 1978. Um, and so Canberra was a place that you could see such things because of the, I guess, the federal government money that paid for um, that level of, of activity. But there was also, you know, art was in the suburbs too. And this is the poster from Australia 75, um, which was, I guess, one of the, the biggest festival event that Canberra has perhaps ever seen. Um, but it's interesting to see that all of those, you know, that art activity is all in the suburbs. You know, this is obviously before the... The, uh, the National Gallery was opened. Another cute one, I have to tell you. Um, the so-called Space Age. This was, you know, something that was very vivid, I'm sure, in our imaginations about the space race. And we had the Meta's um, oven for the whole of the 52 years that we're... And it was, it was called the Space Age, the oven. Um, but the irony of it was, you know, my mother's selection of, you know, petty four tins, you know, because she was the homemaker and had the... Um, you know, did the, the, the entertaining. So kind of, you know, there was a little bit of an irony there. But as kids, um, the, of course, the obsession with, with space and space culture was huge. Um, so I, I guess 
I guess one of the impacts on that has been just an ongoing interest in how, how kind of future technology kind of shapes you. But really, um, it wasn't, it, it, there was a lot missing in, in what we were experiencing as children. And it was really only, uh, you know, when I started going to university in 1981 and I would walk from my bus into the, into the campus that I started to see these incredible posters. Um, and suddenly the world became a much bigger place and the access to ideas, but also that the recognition that, you know, other people were struggling in my own community um, and, and across the world became much more vividly into focus. And, and I think the, uh, particularly this, this work for, of, of artists who were starting the, the, the poster collectives had a huge impact on me. Um, and I, I also remember family friend Dr Michael Denborough led the first um, anti-nuclear, um, uh, one, one, one of the big anti-nuclear demonstrations in, on ANU campus in 1962. Um, so, I guess the, the differences, when I reflect back on it, had only become more real when visiting other places. And a very clear memory is probably a five-year-old when driving through the beachside suburbs of Coogee to visit my father's parents and seeing a range of buildings and cars going everywhere from the back seat and being a little bit confronted by all this, I, I expressed with some kind of awed surprise at how busy and confusing Sydney was. Mm -hmm and clearly remember my mother saying, with slight disdain, yes, Sydney has grown like Topsy. The clear premise was that Canberra was a much better place to live. <coughs> but I think the greatest absence was um, a recognition of the culture and the ongoing presence and significance of local Aboriginal people. This is something that I had to go 10,000 miles away to understand. And I've now become quite deeply affected through this, through my work in, in meeting um, and working with Aboriginal artists and to research items in the CMAG collection. And one of them is this little set of plastic plates um, and with my colleague Sita, who's here, um, that were done in Gungahlin in 1996. So when Gungahlin was being developed as a future suburb, there was a community arts project that invited um, Aboriginal artists with the community, with community artists to um, look at where scar trees were and actually some of the the significant roads and, and so on for that suburb were altered to align with um, where some of the scar trees were. So it has been interesting to, to kind of look at some of these objects. So to, in, in conclusion, um, I just wondered, is it possible to reflect now on the impact, on the emphasis of using such sort of cutting edge design to shape individual and community life in Canberra? I wonder that for a child like me and perhaps others on this panel, the mid-century design approach of space, openness, accessibility and newness encouraged us to be a bit independent, to, op to be open to new ideas and be self-directed. This is obviously a completely non-scientific observation and I look forward to <laughs> reflecting on this with you. But the significance of this conversation, I think, is not that we can wallow in some sort of personal nostalgic bubble but to help contribute these reflections on our recent heritage to help shape current thinking. Um, if any of our experience, I think, um, uh, uh, collectively here, I think they speak to the formative importance of design for the built environment, for the landscape, for the educational and informal learning experiences. And with our experiences, can we influence thinking on the needs and on what needs to be done to help continue to make Canberra a special and unique place to grow up? Thank you.